Okay, today we are going to look at Mao Zedong's um, transformation of the Chinese economy once he and his Communist Party gets into power. Um, one of the things he is known for is uh, how he transformed the economy. Okay. Uh, it, is, it is going to be modeled off of Stalin's transformation of the USSR with a lot less slave labor and a lot less um, purges and direct killings. It's going to be an, um, a rejection of capitalism. So Mao is going to go to get rid of the profit incentive. Uh, people in China aren't going to be working for a profit of money. Um, so without the profit incentive, people are supposed to be working for um, the good of China. And most, uh, most of the major industries are state run and state controlled. So Mao and the communist leaders are going to be directing what's produced, where it goes, where the production goes, and um, what should the resources of China be focusing on. Uh, Mao is going to not fully close off China, but is not going to be a freely trading country with the rest of the world. It's going to be focused more on China themselves. And so let's see how that worked out. The Great Leap Forward, 1958 to 1962. In 1949, the Communist Party of China had emerged so victorious Mao. after a brutal and bitter civil war. Red Star. Their leader, Mao Zedong, set about radically transforming China, which, despite being a vast and highly populated country, was politically weak, very traditional, and lacking in industry. Okay, uh, just about the time where China was supposedly starting to modernize uh, in the early 1900s, um, they're, they're, they get into the civil war between the nationalists and the communists, and, and then they get hit by World War uh, II. So China never really gets, uh, gets a foothold of modernizing uh, with technology. The communists began to modernize China, drawing up the first five-year plan in 1952, emulating the Soviet model of industrialization. This saw extensive investment in heavy industry within the cities in the attempt to increase production. The problem was that in a nation where four-fifths of the population lived in rural areas, there simply wasn't enough people working in heavy industry to allow it to grow to the desired levels. As well as this, the rate of agricultural food production wasn't high enough to allow the industrial workforce to expand further and keep the workers fed. So this is a problem. Um, usually industrialization is an organic growth. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of demand for industrial goods. And so what happens is factories rise up organically. Um, people invent new ways because there's a, a profit motive to get more food to those cities. And it, it can happen pretty, pretty quickly, but usually no one plans the industrialization. Um, uh, the USSR with Stalin was a little different because what Stalin wanted, Stalin got, and you didn't stand in his way. But it's very tough to just say, well, here are the factories. There's um, a lot of pieces that have to support pieces that need to be in place. Uh, an economy is a very finely tuned machine. And when things aren't running correctly, people don't get food. Mao therefore turned his attention to the countryside. Rural China was deeply traditional, with society based on the family and deference to the elderly. And that's gonna come from um, traditions of Confucianism and the five relationships. Peasants would work the land in small family groups, keeping most of their harvest and selling on small amounts. For Mao, seeking to build a communist society in which everyone worked for the state, and a nation which could rival the USA and USSR, this needed to change. Land reform, where estates had been taken from rich landowners and redistributed to the peasants, had taken place shortly after the communists had come to power. Oh yeah, this, this always, this, I can't say always, this often happens with communist revolutions. The very first thing is because, remember, it's a revolution of the people. And communist revolutions happen because they're um, fighting against rich people and uh, rich landowners and rich business owners, okay, and uh, sometimes rich intellectuals. So one of the very first things that happens is uh, communist revolutions have the support of the people. Well, the people must be rewarded. So we saw that in um, uh, Russia becoming the Soviet Union, okay, the, the, no, the land from the nobles was split off and given to the peasants. We saw that in China, the, the, the land was taken from the wealthy landowners and given to the peasants, okay? So we see this happening within the first few years of every, not every, but many communist revolutions where the peasants actually get rewarded for the revolution and they get their own little plots of land. 
But then... Collectivization, where peasants lost their own pieces of land and instead worked for wages on land owned by the state, had also begun to take place. It always, it always seems like uh, the Communist Party wants to get more productivity and more control, and they don't want independent landowners, even if they were the peasants that supported them in the revolution. And so we get a collectivization. The state takes control of the industry of agriculture, the, sorry, shall I say, sector of agriculture, and people become workers, and the state runs the agriculture. Mao believed this wasn't enough to expand both agricultural and industrial production, and instead introduced the second five-year plan in 1958. This would become known as the Great Leap Forward. The Soviet model of development was now rejected. Agricultural and political decisions were decentralized. Technical expertise within the state bureaucracy were now distrusted with political ideology emphasized. The okay, um, let me translate that. Basically, if you were an expert at a sector of the economy, you weren't listened to. It was the, the politics. You had to be high up in the Communist Party. You had to be part of the Communist Party. And that is who made the decisions. So the people who knew how to make decisions weren't listened to. Just the political party was listened to. So I'm of the opinion that no group of humans can regulate an economy as large as China, even if they are experts. So now make them not experts and there's no chance a group of people can regulate an economy. The plan was designed to get laborers in the countryside working at full capacity. This would allow an agricultural surplus, part of which could be forcibly purchased by the government in order to feed industrial workers and expand production in the cities. Remember what Stalin did in the Ukraine, he just took it and left people to starve. He just took it, had the surplus, sold some of it for money, exported it for money, gave it to the cities. So that was, Stal that was Stalin's way of doing it. The plan also sought to find a method to organize rural workers to directly contribute to industrial production. To achieve all of these objectives, the establishment of communes was ordered on a vast scale. In a matter of months, millions of peasants were forcibly banded together in large-scale communes, numbering 20,000 or more people. These communes meant the complete end to individual small holdings, as now all farmers in the commune were responsible for the collective performance of their land. And within 10 years, now everyone sees exactly what the revolution was all about. Absolute control by a small few. It was hoped that labor would be more efficient and food production would grow rapidly, therefore helping agriculture and industry to grow together and prevent the food shortages that had held back industry before. The organization of the communes also provided childcare facilities for the very young and houses of happiness for the elderly, freeing up workers to do their jobs. Sounds nice. Backing was received for the collectivization policy by a wide-ranging program of propaganda. People were encouraged to contribute however they could, such as banging pots to deter sparrows from eating the crops or shooting them down. So this is something that um, Mao did. He, he really got a cult of personality. He got people to believe that they, what they were doing, their life's work was to serve the country of China. And so what anyone could do, they were rewarded for doing whatever they could do. Even if what they did, even if it had no real purpose, movement for movement's sake, to get people moving so they feel like they're contributing. I don't know, um, think for a second. Like, there's really not much killing all the sparrows and shooting them. This is a real story. And people were given rewards for the piles of birds that they could kill. Um, and it got everyone on board. Think if you can figure out what's gonna happen if they kill all the birds. This is a real story. Millions supported the Great Leap Forward enthusiastically at first, especially as it meant readily available food in the commune kitchens, regardless of how much work an individual had done. The policy also gave great power away and influence to local officials in the countryside who had the role of managing the communes. Mao also wanted agricultural workers to contribute to industry under the slogan, walking on two legs. Agricultural workers were drafted from their jobs as farmers to work in the countryside factories. Backyard furnaces were also established where farmers with little to no experience would produce iron and steel. Everything from cooking pots to radiators were to be melted down while wooden furniture and trees became fuel. Um, so making steel is actually a complex process. This is one of the interesting things about uh, Mao's vision. Mao believed that willpower alone, he had uh, uh, a huge view of the Chinese people, that whatever they put their mind to, they could do, regardless of whether you knew how to do it or not. So the fact that so many people wanted to make steel, they didn't need huge factories, they didn't need Bessemer processes, they didn't need all those that technical book learning, they just had to want it really, really hard and then throw the metal into a fire. 
Well, it turns out that making steel is actually a pretty complex process, so this was something that didn't work out too well, the Chinese backyard steel. And it turns out, it turns out that a lot of things got done they didn't get done to the best way, and it costs a lot of lives. I'm thinking specifically of uh, Mal's railroad building, um, where it's just you do something by sheer willpower, throwing bodies at the problem without using the technical solutions. It doesn't work out well. The plan was to increase Chinese steel production from 5 million tons a year in 1957 to a massive 100 million tons annually by 1962. Towards the autumn of 1958, it seemed to many as though things were going well. However, the reality was hidden by the uncommonly good weather of that year, which had led high levels of agricultural production. By the end of the year, some officials were beginning to worry in the knowledge that over-optimism had led rural workers to eating too much of the harvest, leaving stockpiles for the winter and spring of the following year dangerously low. If you know you're always going to get more, and it's free, and it's always provided for you, yeah, it's all, it was abundant and no one, no one is, none of the workers are thinking because they're not in charge, like a small farm is in charge and you know, you know what could happen and you know if things are being produced um, uh, more or less, uh, none of the workers are in charge and they're just given food and so they eat it. Many also recognize the fact that a large proportion of laborers lack the incentive to work in such large communes or that transport and supply problems were causing issues. So logistics is what that is, transport and supply, and those are the things that are so complicated that no people can figure out how to make it work correctly. Um, the reason it works correctly is because of the incentive of money in a capitalist society, is where the money is, the, the supply, someone will figure out how to get things from place to place to fulfill that need. Um, and so it doesn't surprise me in, in the, the con Mao's communist China that it was tough to get needed supplies and products from place to place to place. And they just hinted on it. Um, they just said that enthusiasm wasn't incredibly high. Well, okay, uh, this is a real thing. You take a traditional society, and I would say you take any society, and you say you're gonna break apart the family structure. People live in, in communes of 20,000 people, sleeping in barracks, eating together in large lunch tables and lunch rooms. Um, not raising your own kids at that point, where it's a universal daycare in a society that was used to raising their own kids and used to, used to the family structure. And then you just blow the family structure apart and there's gonna be some pushback. You, you can't just take 2,000 years of, of culture and in two, in two years, blow apart something as fundamental as uh, the family or the village, because it wasn't just blowing apart individualism, it blew apart the idea of a village and put it into these massive city working communes without the city. Something's gonna happen, and people got angry. The steel which was being produced by rural laborers was also found to be unusable, and yeah, much go of figure. it was left to rust. Drafting so many agricultural workers into the factories had caused a shortage of labor on the farms. Scaring or shooting sparrows till they dropped caused a severe ecological imbalance. Because what do sparrows it do? It resulted in an explosion in the vermin population, including crop-eating insects, crop -eating now insects. predators. Deep plowing was another policy that caused great harm to crops. Instead of planting seeds in the normal shallow depths, they were to be planted five feet or 1.5 meters deep into the soil and extremely close together. Now, I'm not sure exactly where this came from, and I could do some research, but chances are it came from some know-nothing bureaucrat high up in the Communist Party who thought it was a good idea, who wasn't an expert in farming. The result was that this severely... I could be totally wrong. ...stunted the growth of the seeds due to overcrowding. Mao soon began to talk of scaling back the Great Leap Forward. However, political rivalry and suspicion soon intervened, with Mao ordering purges carried out against those who criticized his policy. And here's Mao's biggest culpability. He didn't send people to gulags or on the same mass and make slaves out of his own people like Stalin did. He, he didn't have the same amount of millions killed in purges that Stalin did, okay? Um, the biggest problem where we're going to, some people blame Mao for the famine is the culture he set up. No one is going to, no one is going to be able to criticize. No one is gonna ask questions because that's not wanted or allowed. Mao is a dictator, more like Kim Jong-un, more uh, like Fidel Castro, in a sense that he runs the country and it's not 
a high, high level communist party. He is the person. And now everyone is scared to tell him things aren't going well or to say that maybe an idea isn't good. And so every idea, every bad idea gets put into practice. And that you've got to bear some responsibility for the culture you set up as a leader. No one's going to tell now exactly how bad things decisions are and how bad things get. This had the effect of encouraging local officials desperate to protect their positions to continue to support the Great Leap Forward, at times even more keenly than they had done before. Therefore, despite the fact that agricultural production had not expanded, these officials did not dare question orders requiring them to send a large proportion of the grain that did remain to the cities. And when uh, these officials right here, when they were asked how things were going, there are stories that they would put um, put sawdust on these big, big piles of rice. Ha over half the, the thing was filled with sawdust and only rice on the top, so it looked like everything was good, and in reality it wasn't there. And so these guys from the city are going to come in and they're going to take exactly what Mao wants, exactly what the city wants, leaving the sawdust for the people, and this guy gets to keep his job because everyone thinks things are going okay. This had the effect of terrible starvation in the countryside, which became even worse with bad droughts and floods in the harvests of 1959 and 1960. And then floods and droughts come, giving a double, a natural whammy to what's already not working. And there's your backyard steel. The communal kitchens where rice had been freely given in 1958 was now severely rationed in what people received. And in the worst cases, there was nothing available at all. Laborers who didn't meet their quotas would not receive their food rations, so those who were unable to work starved to death. There were accounts of people eating everything living or growing that was left. Well, Goose, obvious. cats, yep, dogs, yep, yep, lime yep. plaster of yep. walls, and the leaves and bark yep. off trees were consumed. All standard. After these were gone, people even resorted to cannibalism and murder to feed their extreme hunger. I, I haven't heard those stories. I would not be surprised. Happened um, in starvation in, in Egypt. Ancient Egypt happened in the sieges of World War II in um, um, the, the Russian Soviet cities. We have accounts that people get driven that far. Despite the famine in the countryside, Mao continued to export grain worldwide and refused any foreign aid to maintain face and convince people that his plans were working. As the food supply going to the cities began to dwindle, famine also hit urban areas. The death toll from the Great Leap Forward at the lower end estimate was said to be 18 million, while upper estimates find that some 45 million people died. Those numbers are just off the charts, and I get it that China had a really big population, but the numbers are just off the charts. Um, let me get you something here. Check this out from some data. Now this is the best guess um, data researchers. We don't have exact numbers, but here's some best guess. Let me start this up. In my lifetime. Okay. So what we're looking at here is here's China. And this is how much people make per person per year. And this is their life expectancy. Right, right around, oh, I'd say 40 years. Okay. So most people, the average person under um, Mao's China, and, and to be fair, it was before too. Uh, most Chinese people lived only, on average, 40, 40 years. Uh, that takes into account infant mortality and such like that. And not a lot of people were rich, so poor and kind of unhealthy. Okay, and so 1950, the communists are in. Let's see what happens in a few years. Former colonies gained independence and then finally... Oh, okay, don't know if you saw that. First off, we are, we are going to see the average life expectancy uh, of the Chinese people go up. They're not going to get richer because that's not what communism does. But then watch this ball just life expectancy plummet during the Great Famine, during the Great Leap Forward. Here you go. In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence and then finally... Boom. Right down to 30, 30 years average life expectancy. Started to get and then and healthier right back. And healthier. So we see it even in the data that that, that, that famine was hugely impactful to the Chinese people. Mao was held responsible for this catastrophe by many people within the Chinese Communist Party. He remained as party chairman, but by 1962, many decisions to do with policy and the economy were taken over by other people. Yeah, the Great Leap Forward was actually so bad that uh, Mao's vision, people had seen it uh, fail, and they very slowly got away from actual um, um, Mao in power. And he is going to regain power later with a cultural revolution. Um, but he wouldn't have had to do a second communist revolution if he didn't kind of lose power because his, his original trial of communism was an utter failure. The communes were scaled back, individual farming was once again permitted, and industrial workers were given greater incentives to work hard. 
Mao, though, remained a powerful figure, able to launch the Cultural Revolution in 1966. Oh, this is nice. They're just making steel. They're just making steel. It's not gonna be good steel. Nope. No, you need factories for that. You can't make good steel in the backyard. Go ahead and try. All right, see ya.